Hi, everybody. Welcome to the second lecture on free will. Uh, this week, we are going to discuss the middle ground between hard determinism and libertarian free will, which is known as compatibilism. Now, looking back at the last lecture, there are two main theories with free will. Hard determinism, which suggests that every action is necessitated by an antecedent cause or reason. And libertarian free will, which is that we have the freedom of choosing our actions from alternate possibilities and then therefore in control of our actions. Now, Two of the implications with these theories is if for a hard determinist, it suggests as though there is no such thing as free will. If antecedent causes cause current actions or there are always reasons for actions, then it would seem as though there's no real choice to be made between doing one thing or another. The thing that we do is determined by our past action. And because we aren't able to change the past, we therefore technically cannot change the present or the future. Libertarian free will, however, argues against this, suggesting that no, we do have free will. There is something fundamental about our ability to choose one thing or another. But with libertarian free will, it makes it uh, with libertarian free will, we have trouble understanding where our choice actually comes from. If it's not based on antecedent causes or reasons, then it seems as though we're just making decisions chaotically or without reason, which would essentially lead to a determinist theory of free will versus a libertarian free will. Now, with both of these positions, both with their problems, both with their kind of intuitiveness, there is a third option that we're going to be talking about in this lecture, which is compatibilism. Now, compatibilism accepts the premises of both determinism and libertarian free will. So we can understand our choices scientifically by assuming that actions are necessitated by these antecedent causes or reasons according to the laws of nature, but that we also have the ability to choose our actions. And so when we accept ownership of our choice, we're suggesting that we had some role to play in choosing one thing or another rather than being forced into choosing one thing or another. And so it's through this theory of compatibilism that we understand both determinism and our ability to take ownership of choosing multiple actions. Now, this becomes very difficult to understand because it would seem as though these two theories work against each other, hard determinism and libertarian free will. They're very contrasting positions. And so we need to understand how exactly they can both be accepted and still understand how it is that we make choices, and then how we can be held responsible for those choices. Because remember, hard determinism will throw a wrench in our understanding of moral responsibility. Because if I have no free will, then how can I be held responsible for the actions that I do? If antecedent causes determine my actions, then it's not my choice to do one thing versus another. So with hard determinism, it would seem as though moral responsibility is, is somewhat thrown out the window. 
Free will, on the other hand, accepts moral responsibility because we are the masters of our choosing. We can choose between two possible alternatives. But with libertarian free will, where does this choice come from? How do we make a choice without reducing that choice to its reasons? This is the question that we need to answer in this lecture. So last week, we talked about this principle of alternate possibilities, where if I have two options and choose one, I'm free because there was another option there to choose from. So as long as there are alternate possibilities, then I can be said to have free will. This, of course, was very problematic, though, and we can see that this week in the video with reference to these Frankfurt cases. Now, a Frankfurt case is an example of when we don't have possible altern we don't have possible alternate possibilities. However, we're still able to take ownership of our action. I think back to the case of uh, the, the voter who's forced to vote Democrat, however, chooses to vote Democrat and is never coerced or forced to not vote Republican. This would suggest that even though there are no alternate possibilities, we can still assign ownership and responsibility to an action. Now, in contrast to compatibilism, we often refer to the contrasting position of incompatibilists. Now, incompatibilists are essentially anyone taking a position of hard determinism or libertarian free will, and basically just assumes that these two positions cannot be married together. Compatibilists, however, will say, no, they in fact can. And when we understand what it means to make choices and how our actions come about, we can see why we can accept both hard determinism and libertarian free will. When we look back to the arguments for hard determinism, we see that the premises claim that we cannot control facts of the past, and we cannot control how facts of the past entail facts of the future. For a determinist, the claim can therefore be made that I cannot control the present or the future. But for a compatibilist, they will need to overcome this consequence argument. The compatibilist is going to have to claim that even though I cannot control facts of the past and I cannot control facts of how the past affects the present or the future, I need to still make the claim that I can control the present and the future. And so how is it that a compatibilist can make this jump that the determinists don't seem to make? One argument that the compatibilists make is the power of necessity of the past argument. This argument begins the same way the determinist argument begins. I cannot change the past. However, with the power and necessity of the past argument, the compatibilists will argue that if I can change the present, then my past must have been different. So, for instance, if I 
am determining, if I'm deciding whether or not I want to eat an entire pizza for dinner tonight. And my options are to either eat the entire pizza or I can eat a salad instead and choose not to eat the pizza. The determinists would say that my choice is made based on prior events. So maybe I had a rough day today and I need just some comforting food. So I'm going to choose to eat the pizza. The compatibilists, on the other hand, will say, when I'm choosing between eating the pizza or the salad, my choice will explain my past. So that if I choose the pizza, it's because my antecedent causes have led me in the direction of the pizza. Namely, I had a bad day. But if I choose the salad, then perhaps my day wasn't as bad as it could have been. And therefore, I chose to eat the salad because I have some constraints still. I have not fallen victim to my desires of eating all of the pizza. So based on my choice, my past must have been different. But does this mean that I can determine my past based on my present actions? Does the claim that I cannot control facts of the past actually negate the idea that I can control facts of the past based on the argument? This argument is a bit odd in that it seems to put the cart before the horse. In that, I'm using reasons of my present to determine what my past was like, rather than using my past to determine my choices in the present. When I choose to eat the salad, it means my past was different. A determinist would make the claim that if I chose the salad, it's because my past was set the way it was. And the determinist would also suggest that I had no choice in eating the pizza or the salad. I had to eat the salad because of these antecedent causes in my past. This argument doesn't seem to do much for the compatibilist. This argument doesn't seem to suggest that we actually do have a choice in the matter. All the compatibilist is saying is that our past must have been different if I can choose. But the determinist is going to claim that I, I can't make that choice now. And to suggest that we can make that choice is a false cause and effect relationship. I don't really have the ability to choose the pizza if I didn't have a rough day. Or if I did have a rough day, I can't choose the salad. I'm going to do based on whatever the antecedent causes determine for me. And so while the compatibilist gets us to think of the past and the present differently, the determinist is going to claim that, well, this is still an argument in my favor and that it's not making it obviously clear where this sense of ownership or choice comes from. Because remember, the compatibilist is going to have to claim that we are determined by antecedent events, but that I should have some ownership in what I choose, because there is an element of me choosing. 
This argument doesn't seem to really do that, though, for the compatibilist. Another argument for compatibilism is the dispositional argument. And the dispositional argument says that the ability to do otherwise is stipulated by other possible worlds where the underlying causal structure of an action is unimpeded. Which means in instances where I make a choice or have the disposition to make a choice, but that choice is impeded upon that causes me to act differently. I could then be said to have had alternate possibilities in that situation. Had I been able to choose my position or choose my choice, then I could have suggested that nothing stood in my way from making the choice. But if the choice went against my position, then it would have been the case that it was because of some impeded action taken. So take, for instance, a, a Jones shooting example. And so here is this person, Jones, who's protecting the president of the United States. And Jones having a gun and protecting the president takes aim at an assassin who's trying to shoot the president. And the assassin, instead of shooting the president, shoots Jones, to which he spins and pulls the trigger in a reaction, and he shoots the president. In this action, we would say that the impeding action of being shot prevents Jones from doing what he intends to do, which is kill the assassin and not the president. So in this instance, Jones is acted on and his free will is taken from him because of this impeded action. If Jones were left to act with the disposition of how he wanted to act, he would be responsible for his action. So what the dispositional argument suggests that there are dispositions to do one thing or another. And if that disposition is impeded upon, then the result of the action will be different. And because there could be a different outcome with a different action, then this is where we get a sense of possible alternatives or alternate possibilities. So an action could be done one way or done a different way depending on what the disposition is to do such and such uh, of action. The problem with this, however, is it puts us in a position of always kind of asking, well, what if I would have acted with this other disposition? Or what if this thing had not impeded or had impeded my action? The determinist is going to be able to stay consistent, claiming that in both instances, it doesn't matter. You're always impeded by antecedent causes. And if you're always impeded by antecedent causes, then there is no real free will. There is no alternate possibilities. Instead, you act based on that impeded action. And the result is the only result that could have happened. Because remember, if my disposition is to do one thing, I have a reason for that disposition. And that reason itself has a disposition that has a reason. And that, disposi that reason has itself a disposition reason. So with the dispositional argument, it seems as though you can continually just pull back and reduce every action to the disposition to do that action. In which case, 
you are left in a very similar spot that the determinist is left in where you go all the way back to the beginning and there is no real choice associated with this compa with this action that you are taking part in. The last of the arguments, and perhaps one of the most famous and popular compatibilist arguments, is the hierarchy account. And the hierarchy account is proposed by Frankfurt, who believes that there is a difference between first order and second order desires, and that it's when both first order and second order desires line up that we gain a sense of free will. We gain a sense of choice. And so when we're talking about first order desires and second order desires, it's important to understand the differences. First order desires are those desires that have actions as their object of focus. So when we're thinking about the hierarchy of orders and desires, it's the case that these first order desires are desires that are shared by almost every uh, species in the animal kingdom. Uh, that I have a desire to eat pizza or the desire to drink a soda, to go to the gym. Uh, animals have the desire to eat, to stay alive, to find shelter, to mate. These are instances of those first order desires that are just focusing on the action at hand or the action that needs to be done in order to fulfill that desire. Now, second order desires are the desires that separate us from many other species in the animal kingdom in that our second order desires, rather than having actions as the object of focus, have other desires as the object of focus. So, I can desire to order a pizza, but I have other desires that may conflict with that, such as the desire to be more fit and healthy. And so I can reflect on my desire to desire pizza and think, well, I would rather fulfill my desire to be fit, and therefore I'm going to act upon the desire to be fit versus the desire to eat pizza because I have that conscious awareness that I can choose and, and this is where the choosing comes into play I have this desire beyond what I'm actually doing I'm desiring more than just to do the action I have this second order desire with regard to another desire. And so when we're thinking of these different desires in this hierarchy, Frankfurt, who really proposes this idea of first and second order desires, would suggest that when your first order desires and your second order desires align, this is when we act with free will. Now, if something were to happen where my first order desire and second order desire conflict because perhaps I'm impeded in some way, then in that case, I, I wouldn't have had free will. So take, for instance, the idea that I want to eat all the pizza. I've had a very bad day. And then a second order desire of, well, I don't, I want to be fit instead. In this instance, my eating the pizza wouldn't be my, if I, if I were to eat the pizza, even though I desired to be fit, I would have a conflicting sense of what I want versus what I do. So here you can see this almost playing out in the other two arguments that we looked at. 
right? I have a disposition to do something, but something ends up happening and I just end up eating all the pizza because I had a bad day. Now, in that instance, my antecedent events will cause me to eat all the pizza, namely that I've had this bad day, I'm just in a mood, so I'm going to eat all the pizza. I don't care. However, my choice to eat pizza was not what my disposition or it was not what my second order desire was focused on. Instead, my second order desire was focused on staying fit. Let's say I had, I didn't have the willpower to do that. And therefore, I ended up in this situation where I ended up eating pizza anyway. Now, we could say, though, that while I didn't have the free will to eat the pizza, if I were to have not eaten the pizza, then I would have had the free will because now my second order desire of wanting to be fit more than eating the pizza aligned with me being fit. So I made the choice freely to not eat the pizza because it aligned with my second order desire. This understanding of first and second order desires is, is a bit complicated. And so let me try and explain it in a different way. When it comes to first order desires, these are the desires where the action is the focus of that desire. And so if I want to eat something, then eating it is my effective first order desire. With that effective first order desire, I am able to take ownership of that choice to eat what I want because, and this is particularly true with most people, we have the ability to rein in our first order desires with second order desires. And those second order desires are the desires for that desire. And so I can overrule my first order desire with a second order desire, which will issue in the opposite first order desire. Let's take this instance as an example. I'm out surfing. And somebody cuts me off and drops in on my wave. My first order desire is to punch this person in the face the next time I get up next to him. If I were to punch this person in the face, I would have to take ownership for committing battery. But depending on my second order desire, whether or not there's a second order desire there, it may not account for my free will. And there's a difference between taking ownership and having free will. Now, if I want to punch this person in the face, which is my first order desire, but then I think about that desire and think that I should not be having this desire because if I were to act on that desire to punch the person in the face, I might get arrested for battery. In that case, I might refrain from punching the person in the face because my second order desire of wanting to do away with that first order desire has overruled it 
And therefore, the action that I do, which is not punch the person in the face, aligns with my second order desire of not wanting to punch the person in the face because I might get arrested for battery. So in this scenario, I gain my free will when my second order desire aligns with the effective first order desire that I actually do. If, however, I want to punch the person in the face, and I know that if I punch the person in the face, I might get arrested for battery, but my emotions are too strong and I punch the person anyway. This would be an example of not having my second order and first order desires align. Now I'll still take ownership because I had the effect of first order of wanting to punch the person in the face. But I wouldn't be exercising my free will because of the fact that my second order desire is telling me not to do this. It's something outside of my power. And if it's outside of my power, then my free will is taken from me. But I would still have to take ownership for this action. Now, this of course is incredibly problematic because it would seem as though any of the first or second order desires still need to explain the antecedent cause that causes those desires. A determinist might suggest in the case, in the example of someone cutting me off, that my second order desire of not wanting to punch this person because I might get arrested actually has another second order desire pulling against it, saying that, no, I do want to do this. So uh, imagine the, the little devil and the little angel on my shoulder, one saying, do it, do it, do it. The other saying, don't do it, don't do it, don't do it. Whatever my action is, it must mean that that devil or angel won out. And if that devil or angel won out, then that was the superior second order desire. And so even with this freedom based on aligning first and second order desires, it doesn't really show how we have a choice in whatever it is that we're doing. It still seems as though the determinist position can't be undone because if I'm using a second order desire to support my first order desire, then that second order desire will still require an antecedent cause for why this was the particular second order desire that was chosen. So you see, in any instance, the determinist claims that an antecedent cause is present regardless of first or second order desires, whether or not the desire comes from within a person 
or from an outside source in any event, right? Even, even when I think to myself, I want to punch this person in the face, but I know better and I know that I shouldn't punch this person in the face. I still within me have a reason why that second order desire is not going to affect the first order desire. And I actually am going to punch the person in the face because somewhere down the line, there will be a hierarchy of desires that push me towards the action of my choosing or the action that I in fact do. And so the hard determinist is able to explain this situation and scenario with desires and the hierarchy of desires in the same way as the compatibilist. But the determinist doesn't incorporate an element of choice or necessarily ownership while the compatibilist does. And the compatibilist's argument for why I should take ownership or, or why I should say that my choice is a free one doesn't really adhere to the idea that everything happens for a reason or that there are antecedent causes for every action. And so while Frankfurt might suggest that a person's free will and ability to have these second order desires or second order volitions as he calls them. While he suggests that that leads to a sense of free will and personhood, because remember, certain animals don't have this second order desire. Certain animals aren't able to have desires about desires. They merely desire actions. Our personhood and the alignment of this second order desire with the first order action creates an agent's free will. But to what extent that they create some type of choosing or alternate possibility just doesn't seem to be explained in these arguments. And so we need to ask ourselves, what is it that makes my ability to choose a thing? How is it that when I'm presented with two options, that I can choose one and not choose the other, or choose the other and not choose the one, without suggesting that there is a reason for why I've chosen one? This is the problem when it comes to free will. And the difficult aspect is that the scientist in us will tell us that there's got to be a reason for why I choose one over the other. But our intuition and our feelings suggest that I really can pick one or the other. I'm not forced into it. So what makes it an action that we ought to take ownership for? This is the question that is asked when dealing with free will. And it's up to us to be able to answer this to adequately explain why we should be held personally responsible for our actions if in fact we can't choose what it is that we're doing. Is it the case that I can still be responsible even if determinism is the case? This is the, this is, uh, the, uh, the big question, the moral question that faces us with free will.